everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Pathfinder of 2024. I'm very excited to have my first guest of the year, Dan Faber from OrbitFab. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. I actually did not ask. Do you go by Dan or Daniel? <laughs> Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so you've definitely gotten that one before. <laughs> a few times. So uh, tell us a little bit about where you're calling in from today. Uh, calling in from Colorado, global headquarters of, uh, of OrbitFab. It's, it's funny, I've actually, I've spoken about your company in the past to folks, um, or it's come up in conversation, however it may. Um, and the, the typical the one liner that I use to describe your company is, oh, they're building gas stations in space, fuel depots in space. Is that correct? Is that how, if you were, if you were given one or two sentences to describe what you're doing at OrbitFab, is that how you'd describe it? Yeah, I and mean, we trademark the phrase gas stations in space. Just a comment next time you say it to add a T. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize, I didn't realize that. Yeah, as, as an engineer, of course, a, a little bit of me died inside when, when we decided to call it that or to use that as a, a tagline because we're not selling gas and it's not stationary and <laughs> not exactly right, which is what, of course, allows it to be trademarkable as it's not a, not a description. But it does conjure up in people's minds almost exactly what we're doing, right? There are lots of companies out there that are building satellite servicing vehicles like tow trucks in space. Sure, sure. Great. Great. They're tow trucks. We're gas stations. It works <laughs> perfectly. Yeah. No, I, I, the an analogies helps, especially for the folks that aren't super familiar with the industry, but not our audience. So why don't we jump right into it? So um, would love to hear a little bit about uh, maybe how you got into this business. Tell us a little bit about your your career arc and really what inspired you to build OrbitFab. Gosh, yeah, how far back do you want to go? I, I grew up on a farm in Tasmania, the end of the world. Um, my dad was an engineer, my mom's a scientist, so I was doomed to do something technical, read too much science fiction probably. Um, went to university in Sydney and decided that we should get some people off this rock. That would address some existential risks, be pretty important for humanity and probably be a fun career. Um, but there was no space agency at the time in Australia, there was nothing happening. So I decided, well, I guess I'm going to have to do something myself. Uh, I wrote down a list of industries that I thought could pay for the first permanent jobs in space. And that list was tourism and mining. And I decided that mining was more aligned with the mechanical engineering degree that I was getting and, uh, and with my personality. So I've been chipping away at things related to asteroid mining ever since. So got my mechanical degree, um, went off and built a bunch of satellites around the world. Uh, and then started building companies. So OrbitFab is company number four. Can I, uh, I'm going to ask an ignorant question and it's going to describe, it's going to give everyone uh, a sense of my uh, geography capabilities, but where is, can you t tell me a little bit about Tasmania and where it sits on the map? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, Australia is a continent. Uh, Tasmania is a state of Australia, but it's an island off the bottom of Australia. Okay. Um, so directly south of the east coast of Australia, um, kind of close-ish to New Zealand, if you like. It's the only wet, green, rainy part of Australia. Um, lovely place to grow up, cleanest air in the world, a great place to be from, but um, a lot of uh, a lot of young people leave it. The biggest export is young people. There's not a lot of opportunity. Yep. What, what, where does, um, where does, uh, and, and, you, and you said you, you went to university in Sydney, you said? That's right. Yeah. So where, where um, I'm kind of curious, um, you know, when you went to school there versus today, like where does space fit into the mindset of, of, uh, you know, college students in Sydney? Is that even, I mean, you mentioned mining, of course, one tourism and, you know, another, but is, is space something that's being discussed more, more often these days as a career path? Uh, these days it is, but you know, show my age 25 years ago. Um, there, I used I used to joke that I knew everyone in the, I knew all six people in the Australian space industry. <laughs> it, it wasn't particularly large. Uh, Australia had bipartisan political support for never having a space agency. Um, wow. That did a one eighty as soon as New Zealand launched a rocket. Thank you, Rocket mm -hmm. Lab. Um, Im immediately, it was imperative to everybody that Australia must have a space agency. We couldn't let New Zealand get ahead. It was hilarious. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, at the at the time, Australia sort of believed that we had a space agency called NASA and it was great because someone else paid for it um, and that was kind of good enough. And uh, there's a lot of – and satellites are used a lot in Australia. They're kind of invisible, but, you know, such a large continent with so few people on it um, really lends itself well to using satellite communications. Uh, and so there is a, uh, a satellite operator there that uh, – 
back in the 80s was part of the government monopoly uh, telecoms company and then got privatized and eventually bought by Singtel and uh, I'm not sure who owns it now. Um, but they operate a lot of satellites over that uh, that part of the world. Um, for the defense and, and intelligence community, it's the unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So there's lots of, of ground stations receiving data and things like that. So it's, it's not something that Australians are completely unfamiliar with. It's just not something that we talk about and do very much. That, of course, has changed dramatically. Now Now that Rocket Lab are launching, now that we've got a space agency, Australia is engaging a lot more and uh, you know, to be seen exactly what Australia will be able to accomplish. But you've got a highly educated workforce that's finally being pointed in that direction. Uh, young Australians don't have to leave like I did in order to get into the industry. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the future. Right, right. Interesting. Well, so so let's jump back to Orbit Fab. So give us a little sense of like, you know, what ultimately prompted the origins of the business? Like where, why was, uh, why, why is now the right time to be building fuel depots in space? So I got into it because I, my previous company, Deep Space Industries, where our big, hairy, audacious goal was asteroid mining. Um, no one was buying that. It's <laughs> it's a long term off and there's a lot of risks. But um, when I took over as CEO there, I brought in a, a technology strategy. We built small thrusters to move satellites around in orbit, um, partly because the world needed some small thrusters. Right, There were no thrusters for small satellites, but also partly because we realized the first thing you'll sell off an asteroid is propellant. Right? There's more value in the propellant than there is in the metals. But nobody was using the materials, uh, the propellants that you could make from the materials in an asteroid. So we built a line of thrusters at Deep Space Industries that could use those materials. Um, you know, that, that was acquired by Bradford Space out of, out of Europe, and those thrusters are still going. Um, but uh, I sort of stepped back from that and started looking at what I was going to do next and was talking with um, potential satellite servicing companies, uh, satellite operators, and started asking, like, what what fuels would you like? What commodities would you use in space? How much would you pay for them today? Like, I'm no longer hung up on on trying to build a strategy where everything has to come from an asteroid. Let's just think about this as a market, right? What, what would you pay for the fuels you can get today? And I fell off my chair. I was absolutely shocked. The marginal revenue that a lot of these companies can see from every kilogram of extra propellant is over a million dollars. Now, we know we could probably cut some good deals with launch companies, right? If we sneak something in as a late arrival payload, and maybe we can, you can buy in bulk. We'll, we'll get to orbit for $1,000 a kilo. So that gives us three orders of magnitude potential arbitrage. And the seventh or eighth time I, I heard that million-dollar number, I'm like, that's it. We're going to shut everything else down that we're looking at. We've got to focus on this. It's, it's all in on orbit fab. And that's, that's really where it came from. So you're 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 alluding a little bit to your business model, which I'll get into uh, in 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 just a second. But uh, can you tell me a little bit about? Can you talk a little bit about the market, right? So uh, from from a from a high level point of view, clearly a lot more satellites up in space today than there were before. There's a sign, there's a cost associated from those satellites operating for a particular useful life. Um, yeah, in which case most of the time right now. What happens is they just you know either deorbit or they just stop functioning and they're not they're not in operations anymore. Have you done any work around understanding? Uh, actually, I should say I'm sure you have done work around this, but like, what is the cost of uh, of of not having right now a business like Orbit Fab? What does that cost to um, operators today? Yeah, I, first of all, sort of step back. Satellites need fuel because there's nothing to grab onto. Right. You're constantly drifting in space. It's one of the things that always bugs me about movies where people are supposed to be in zero gravity is that they can hang there and not just twist and turn. Zero gravity, nothing to, to grab onto. Everything is always moving. And so you need fuel to get back to where you're supposed to be, to stay coordinated with other satellites in your constellation. In geostationary orbit, to stay over that spot on the ground that you're supposed to be servicing. And the moon is tugging you and the sun is tugging you and Earth's gravity field is lumpy. You just inevitably end up drifting. So even if you want to stay still, you can't do that without fuel in space. It's your one consumable and eventually it runs out. And it becomes the limiting factor on spacecraft. 85% of spacecraft are thrown away because they run out of fuel, which is incredible. And for, for a space force, right, when you're in a contested environment, they're sitting ducks. Right? The whole game is don't move your satellite. The fuel that we do have, we use to stay in the same position just to make sure everybody really knows where we are. It's terrible. They, they want to be moving in surprising ways. They need fuel to do it, and they've just not been able to in the past. And you look at satellite servicing, right, the business model of, of tow trucks in orbit, you need to be able to go from satellite to satellite to satellite. You want to be able to grab a satellite and tow it. 
everything in that needs fuel. The, the Northern Sky Research has been doing reports for the last several years on the satellite servicing market. And you can see that, you know, they break it down into um, tug services and active debris removal and various different things. More than 75% of that market, which they're predicting over the next 10 years is, is you know, $20 billion or something, more than 75% of it is fuel dependent. It's absolutely critical that we get a, a supply of fuel. And if we want to look forward to when we've got a bustling economy in space, right, when there's there's actually space tourism and people are living in space and we're manufacturing in space. We need a lot of consumables. We need a lot of things happening. We, we're going to need an industrial chemical supply chain in orbit. And the fuel is the first step propellant. So that's fundamentally where we're coming at this. So using your example, if such a significant portion of that is fuel dependent servicing, does that mean that your initial customer base are in fact the satellite servicers? Yeah, split 50-50 between government customers that want to use it directly and satellite servicing customers that, that want to service the legacy satellites. Right? Over time, because there was when we started, there was no gas cap. There was no fueling port. So we built a fueling port. It's the first commercially available fueling port for satellites. Um, it's being now ad adopted by quite a number of, of spacecraft operators. Um, until you've got that fueling port on the satellite, it's not we, we can't refuel it. We're not going to go in and do robotic surgery. Uh, we're not developing tech to attach jetpacks or anything like that. We leave those things up to the satellite servicing companies, right? If you're not equipped to be refueled and you're not you know, behaving properly and ready to accept the fuel, call a tow truck. We'll provide fuel to the tow trucks and indirectly provide your service. Once you've got the fueling ports in the future, we can go directly to the constellations and, uh, and the operational satellites and refuel them. Have you done, you, I, as far as I know, OrbitFab has not done a fuel um, uh, demonstration so far, right? As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong. We put up two test beds to the International Space Station. So we did transfer water in that case back and forth between those, uh, those two tanks uh, and ended up offloading that to the space station. That was all inside the pressurized volume, but we came, became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. Uh, we then followed that up. We, we put a fuel depot into orbit. Uh, and that fuel depot had the first version of our fueling port. So that was an important test going through all the range safety, fueling it on the ground, using that fueling port, putting it in orbit and, and monitoring the, the behavior. Uh, that got us, that was kind of the, the requirements discovery. Right? How do we know what people want in a product when they've never thought about this product before? You've got to try and force it into their hands and have them tell you that it's crap. And then your most valuable document is your list of requirements. They finally tell you what you need to build. So we've done that. Now we're shipping these fuel imports. Um, there are some going up in the next couple of months um, on, on some vehicles. There's nothing in orbit yet that has it. Um, but we're under contract to deliver fuel uh, to the US DOD in 2025. So we're working towards that as our first commercial delivery. Got it. Okay. Well, so on, on that point, why don't we actually just talk about your business model? Like how does... Orbit Fab make money today, right? What are sort of what are the core? What are the core? Actually, I should say, how do you intend on making money in the near term, and what are your kind of core product? What's your initial core product? Yeah, and we we sell fueling ports, but I'll be honest, I give them away for free if I thought that they'd get adopted because that's the serviceable market for fuel. Um, the main product we sell is fuel, so we will deliver that fuel, or you you can come and get it. Which service level would you like, delivery or, or self service? Um, but basically, we we have the fueling ports on the clients, the rafty fueling port, and then we have a, a fuel shuttle, either ours or one that we can contract somebody else with, with our fueling equipment on it um, to go and deliver that fuel. Um, that has to be as small as possible because it's moving around a lot. We don't want to drag all of the fuel around. So then we also have big fuel depots, just big dump tanks that we can put on any rocket we can get to orbit. So when, once the fuel shuttle runs low, it can get more fuel from the depot. And then, uh, and then go and deliver more fuel to the customers. So that's it. Simple architecture. So you intend, you actually are building your own, your own shuttle along with partnering with service or servicing companies that can do it for, for yourself as well. That's right. In the clean room okay. downstairs, we've got uh, all the avionics together for a, uh, a refueling demonstration mission. Got it. Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, so uh, as just a um, uh, more of a general business model question, is launch your biggest cost? Like getting the fuel depots to space. How do you yeah. work with the launch? How do you any, any? How do you work with the launch providers? Yeah, absolutely. Launches launches the biggest input cost to this business, so we track against that pretty closely. Uh, of course, we look forward to the launch costs coming down. That will increase the uh, amount of customers and the amount of business we get to do. We can drop our prices accordingly. So 
we track that uh, as aggressively as we can. Um, but yeah, we're looking for we're looking for deals because we have a very low cost payload. Right, the, the fuel is a fraction of the cost of the launch. So the better deal we can get on launch, great. If it's if it's risky, then that's fine. We're very risk tolerant, and so that's that's how we work with that. Um, we're always looking for ways to get fuel to orbit by hook or by crook, and, and we can pass on that savings to our customers. Are you uh, are customers currently paying you? Uh, how are the contracts structured? If you can share, are they like um, c- customers paying you today? Uh, are they like structured as more like kind of in the energy sense, like forward contracts where you know they're they're uh, si- entering into a contract for fuel delivery at a certain date, and there's an exchange of of fuel and cash on that date. How, how, are, how are you kind of thinking about uh, contract structuring and, and, and I guess therefore revenue? Yeah, I know mean, uh, a couple of ways. The, the government is willing to support the development. I mean, this is, whilst I talk about huge margins and things like this, it's a, it's a hideous business to close because we invest all of this money to develop the technology to convince people that it's reliable and safe and that they should take the fueling port uh, and take get refueled. And then, of course, they buy a fuel import and they wait until they run out of fuel before they want to buy fuel. And we get gapped on that. The cash flow is terrible. We're carrying all of our financing costs. Um, it's a horrible business model. And so everything we do is about reducing capital costs and bringing forward cash flow. We obsess about that. So the government is prepared to uh, to, to forward the money in, in advance of the delivery. That's been very helpful, uh, whether that's um, R&D type contracts, whether it's uh, you know, things they want to have tested to, to levels that will satisfy them that, that, that it's safe, whether it's uh, and, you know, even the, the first fuel contract, um, we receive a lot of that money before we make that first delivery. Um, and then commercially, we have take or pay contracts, forwards contracts, as you say, where people will sign up to a, a price and a delivery date in the future, um, but they won't pay us until we make that delivery. We then take that to a bank, like we go to, to third party financing with those contracts. Uh, and in that way, we can debt finance the uh, the business. And so both of those are able to monetize up front to make sure the cash flow works. Um, with the, the take or pay contract, we really look at how the risk is managed on that. What's the risk for the client? Are they prepared to, to manage it? How do we share the risks so that um, as we make an investment, um, we are not stuck if that investment is orphaned if they decide not to take the fuel, right? And we've really got to balance uh, who takes the risks uh, according to you know what the situation is, but at the end of the day, when when you've got potentially three orders of magnitude arbitrage, there's enough benefit in there for everybody. We can incentivize everybody on that chain, even if that includes long term financing costs, and that's absolutely key to the business. Then is figuring out who is going to take what risk and how they're going to be compensated for it. So interesting. So you're, you're, what you're effectively alluding to is either right now or down the road. Uh, an ability to effectively enter into these con- these contracts and then and then in, in effect h- hedge away your risk, sell away your risk at some I don't know I assume some discount. Just looking at kind of tra- like traditionally how it's done in, in most other energy sources. Um, is, am I hearing that? Do you expect there to be a, a market for fine uh, what I'd say financial buyers to buy that those contracts at a discount from you? Absolutely. We've, we've already seen the interest from the financial community in, in being the counterparty on these contracts. Um, they're looking at us and saying, well, where are they? Bring us, bring us more contracts so we can finance them. That's, that's kind of nice. Um, it's nice to know that's not a risk in the business model. Uh, of course, it comes with different costs and, and you know, what are they prepared to finance it at? <clears throat> One of the things that we realized early on is that the, the folks that provide debt financing don't understand space operations risk. Right? It freaks them out that they might be putting money down for something that could, you know, the spacecraft could fail and they don't understand what that risk is. So our, uh, um, we, we went out and talked to the insurance companies and our seed round, our seed investment round was led by Munich Re Ventures. And Munich Re is one of the biggest insurance companies in the world and the biggest underwriter of satellites and rockets. And so Munich Re Ventures invested in us because they wanted to see how risk profiles might get changed in the industry, right? If you can recover a satellite, then you reduce the amount that uh, that might be a, a payout on any particular failure. Um, but similarly, we're interested in in uh, new types of risks that need to be covered. We're also interested in insuring against the operational risk for our ability to deliver to our customer 
or uh, or various things like that. But if we can take that in sh- that uh, space operations risk and get insurance policy on it, we can then take the financing risk, which is what the debt finances are used to, and finance purely against that. So we separate the two risks for people that are the most comfortable with them and will give us the best rates against them because they have the best models on what is the risk they're taking. And so again, dividing up the risk and figuring out the best place to to, to place it is part, is really integral to the business model. So looking at a common or a trend that a lot of folks have been talking about for um, caught the last three to five plus years is that, you know, satellites are getting smaller, they're getting cheaper, um, you know, performance to cost ratios are increasing that time between, you know, V1 to V2, you know, improvement, obviously just look at Starlink, right, from what they were to what they are now, and that capability is changing quite rapidly. So there is a need also for satellites to replace themselves, not just for fuel reasons, but for technology reasons. Do you think that the cost structure of satellites are such that uh, fuel is uh, import is is important, but not as important as it once was because of how cheap satellites have gotten. At least in low Earth orbit, I'm not necessarily commenting on geostationary satellites, which are still quite expensive. But um, what what do you think about that? I'm sure yeah, you, I'm sure you have an answer to this. <laughs> yeah, we definitely hear that a lot. We yeah. we hear that a lot from the VCs that have backed companies whose main story is satellites are small and cheap and disposable. And no one's believed that before. We're going to build these satellites small and cheap and disposable, and we're going to win the market. And you brought up Starlink. It's a great example. How much did the first generation Starlink spacecraft weigh? Uh, I want to say 500 kilograms, maybe. Yeah, I think it was less than 500. How much did the latest generation weigh? Yeah, it's a lot more than that. It's It's a fair point. They're not getting smaller, right? Small is really good to do your R&D, right? Small, quick, get it to orbit, let it fail, especially in a low orbit where where it won't cause a debris problem, right? Prove that your business model works, prove that your technology works. But once you get serious, economies of scale. Everybody goes in that direction constantly. And there's a lot of fuel on those Starlink satellites, right? They're launching a lot of them. There's a reason they had to go away from Xenon. It would have broken the bank. Absolutely. So they, they went to Krypton and that would have broken the bank and now they're trying to go to Argon, right? Fuel is a problem for them. And Argon is it's suboptimal for a number of reasons, but every fuel combination, every fuel is, is suboptimal for one reason or another. At the end of the day, yeah, this is the generation they're at now. You cast yourself forward into what they're going to be building. There's a lot of fuel. Every Constellation operator is going to be putting up an enormous amount of fuel. That's just the, the honest truth of it. Right. Um, all right. Fair enough. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, customer attraction so far. Uh, so, so talk a little bit about what you're doing. Um, maybe let's start with the government first. So um, I know that you've publicly announced a contract, um, at least one, as far as I know, with the government. Maybe talk a little bit about what traction you've been having with the DOD and what is it that they're looking for um, from your from your product? Yeah, it's pretty simple. This, all the Space Force satellites are sitting ducks. Right? They can't get out of the way if something untowards happens. Uh, Everybody knows exactly where they are and when they should cover up their assets if they don't want them seen. They need to be, this is is nothing new. It's been said by generals in front of large crowds. Uh, If we had fuel available in orbit, we would not be operating satellites where where we are today. We would be zipping around, we'd be keeping the adversary off balance, right? We'd be doing things very, very differently. If you agree with them that space is a contested environment, they don't have a choice. And that's caused timelines to shift to the left for the government. It's impressive. So there's a lot of pressure on us and and other people working on different aspects of satellite servicing that are important to this. There's a lot of pressure to deliver uh, because they want it as quick as possible. And then on the commercial side, I know you have uh, have, a contract with the likes of companies like Astroscale. Yeah, that's right. So we're doing a lot of things with Astroscale on three continents at this point. You know, they're, they're doing very well on the satellite servicing side. Um, so our agreement with, uh, with them takes the form of that, uh, that take or pay contract. Uh, so it's a, it's a contract for delivery in a, in a few years' time, but they've locked in a price. Uh, they've got quantity set up. They've got flexibility within that contract. Um, you know, they've, they've managed the risk on that so that they're, uh, they're very comfortable with with what's happening there. Uh, meanwhile, it gives us the assurance that our commercial customers are, are lining up. It's been it's been a really good relationship. Now, uh, 
just getting into the kind of actual fuel aspect of the business, like what um, what types of are are you offering one type of fuel, multiple types of fuel? Talk to me about the logistics of that. Yeah, we started out with um, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, if you like, the thing that is the easiest to deal with and is in the most demand. That's hydrazine. Um, U.S. government they're comfortable using hydrazine. They've used it for a long time. They use a lot of it. They um, they have programs with electric propulsion. They don't like them. They don't want to have to move slowly, right? They want dynamic space operations, and electric propulsion just isn't dynamic. So once they have a, a refueling option, they're probably going to move away from that. If you think about it from a commercial side, there's also an incentive to move away from electric propulsion because it's slow. It requires you to take more solar panels. Uh, and so having refueling will probably shift the needle back towards chemical propulsion. Um, you know, on another angle, the Europeans are trying to move away from um, toxic propellants. And so there's a lot of programs in Europe on different types of propellants. And that's, uh, you know, that's got us looking at, uh, at different things. So our second generation of interfaces and refueling systems will be looking e- either at propellants like nitrous and hydrocarbons or um, you know, perhaps xenon, krypton. We're, we're currently weighing up exe- exactly which direction we go for the next generation of, of propellants. But in the end of the day, we we follow the market, right? We will deliver what the de- market demands. What were uh, what were some of the findings from the Tanker One demo mission, and and in terms of uh, any findings or anything that are are um, informing kind of subsequent designs? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing there, we we flew the Rafty Block One, and the Really, the, the most important thing was we could try and give it to the big aerospace companies. We can try and give it to the government and say, why aren't you buying these? This enables you to get this huge benefit. Why don't you take this fueling port? It's flown, right? It's got flight heritage, been qualified. Um, and they laughed, they laughed us off and said it was ridiculous. But importantly, they said why it was ridiculous, right? They, they gave us a list of requirements. And they said, don't have exposed O-rings. That's a bad idea. Don't do X. Don't do Y. These are bad ideas. When we run our spacecraft, here's what we worry about. Here are the issues you bring in. And we we thought about most of them, right? We'd run into most of those issues as we were going. There were some that we had, but we were able to turn around then very quickly because we'd already started working on that design, right? We turned around very quickly and we met all of the um, requirements that they had, which blew them away. So we turned some skeptics into, into champions, uh, inside the government and inside some of these big prime contractors. Uh, and that was super important. Far and away, the most valuable thing that we did was to get that feedback and be able to to upgrade uh, the Rafty fueling port. What uh, what technical hurdle, or I shouldn't say maybe technical, but just hurdles in general have you faced with standardization of the Rafty port? Well, we haven't got obsessed by trying to standardize it. Mm-hmm. Because we want to test it thoroughly. <laughs> the last thing you want is to have the world standardize on something that just isn't good. Um, but also, we believe that the standard will end up being something good, right? Uh, but you know, de facto, the reason that VHS beat Betamax was because VHS could record two hours of video. Betamax could only record one. And it turns out what the industry wanted was two hours of video. All right. And so that's what happened. You've got to have a product that fits what the market wants. And that's what we're trying to do. Just provide the most responsive product, right? That's why it was so important that we got that customer feedback. And we we didn't start the design until we talked to 30 different companies and organizations about it. Now we've talked to, I don't know, hundreds uh, of different companies, organizations, stakeholders within those companies, asking them, like, how will you use it? How do you want to buy it? Right. How should we package it? What color should it be? Just everything you can imagine. Um, yeah, trying to put it into people's hands and getting them to reject it with reasons. Some of the most valuable things that we could do. When do you think the industry will be at a point um, in, 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 in how are you thinking about it in your own internal models in terms of like when you'll have satellite servicing uh you know, spacecraft zipping around, refueling satellites, you know, using your own shuttle, like you'll see a robust sort of need for, for not just, I mean, not just fuel, right? Just for in general, just servicing in general, like once you have these large constellations up in space and they need constant maintenance and, and, and refueling, like when do you think that time period really starts to kick in? Like how far away from that are we? Yeah, we, we're seeing the government and 
again, this is this is not my words. There have been generals who stood up and said, by the end of the decade, we're not going to be buying any satellites that can't be refueled. Yeah. And they started saying 2030 and then moved out to 2028. We'd like to help them move that to 2026. And then when will they need to be refueled? Well, as soon as they run out. When will they run out? That depends how aggressively they move them. But if you think about the... Um, the history of, of the, the Xerox photocopier, right? They, that was a massively expensive machine and it competed with the, the Gestetner carbon copy machine. So you didn't really need it. Um, the argument that Xerox made was, you know, it's cheaper by the copy and it's better quality and no one was buying a massively expensive machine. So they came up with a business model. We'll give you the machine if you sign up to a certain number of copies a, a week. And as soon as people had it, and the marginal cost of pushing the button to get another copy was so low, and in fact, it probably was in somebody else's budget, they just kept pressing the button. And it set Xerox up for 50 years, right? It was a phenomenal business model. Same kind of thing, right? As soon as the operators have the ability to just press the button and get refueled, they're going to press the button, and they're going to keep pressing the button. They're immediately going to change how they operate. And the tempo of operations will increase, and the refueling frequency will increase. So we absolutely expect to see that happen as soon as folks have fueling ports on orbit. You have a lot of these examples up your sleeve. I, I kind of want to ask, are you a student of history or did you like, you know, figure out these ideas as you were, as you were, you know, it's, it's, I, I actually asked that question only because there's a book I recent I, I, I read that I, that I've, I, I, I talk about quite, quite frequently and I think you'd enjoy it. Um, <laughs> which is a book called uh, engines that move markets and, Ooh, uh, I don't know if you that now. That sounds great. Yeah, it's a great book. It basically starts off with like sort of the 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 uh, the industrial. I, I think either with the canal system or the British Industrial Revolution, but basically it goes through every major technical innovation that's occurred really in history since that time period to like the internet effectively, and goes through like the capital market cycle and also the innovation, just like sort of the uh, the the the, the uh, supply demand cycle of that technology. It's fascinating. What you actually ended up seeing is just, you know, uh, we're, we humans are just a pattern and we keep repeating and we keep repeating and we keep repeating and we never, or never learn. But there's so many interesting technological examples. Anyway, you're, what you're saying kind of reminds me of that. I've already looked it up on and it's not there. I'm going to have to buy it. It's not. It's actually, it's actually quite... It's like some, you know, there's like a few paper paper copies that you can find somewhere, but it's a, it's a, it's a great read. Um, so can we... Uh, go ahead. I... I um, I'll admit my, my first startup company uh, was doing instrumentation for the, the mining industry, the terrestrial mining industry, um, and it ran into the global financial crisis and died. <clears throat> Lots of you know, reasons as why, but basically at the end of the day, the world ran out of money. Uh, we were tracking some cast customers whose market cap was one third of their cash in bank. Um, it got insane. Um, and I was asking myself, what the hell happened and why? So I went off and, and started a master's of economics. And that may be what sent me down the path of being interested in histories and stories. Because what I discovered was that economists had no idea at all, but they had great stories. They could try and explain something. So I took to finding ways to explain and analogies to use for what I think is the truth. And then just put it out there, right? You're, you're betting on this or, or one of these stories to be true, right? One of these hypotheses about where the world is going is, is, could be true, in which case a bet on Orbit Fab would win, for example, right? And I can tell you seven scenarios where Orbit Fab wins and a couple where we, where we don't. Where do you want to place your, your bets? That's, that's what we're at. And every startup has to do that, right? So, yeah, I've, uh, I've got analogies that go back to uh, <laughs> the age of steam and the age of <laughs> sale. Um, back in the 1800s and, and earlier. I, I think uh, I was outdone, though, by General Shaw, um, who I've already been quoting without attribution already. Um, but he went back to Napoleon talking about the importance of maneuver for prevailing in conflict mm -hmm. and basically said, if you can't maneuver, you can't prevail. And he brought it all the way up to the Space Force and basically said, where are we? We need to move. Yeah, great point. Once you once you get a chance to read that book, we can do another show where we just talk analogies for a while. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, so let's talk about competition, right? Who else is doing this? Is there anyone else doing this? Uh, there are other people that have been thinking about it and looking at it and chipping away. And everyone who who starts a satellite servicing company um, thinks that they'll boil the ocean and that they'll they'll do refueling. 
Uh, when we started OrbitFab, there are seven or eight companies working on satellite servicing. There are now almost 200. Mm. Uh, it's a staggering number, right? From, from folks building orbital transfer vehicles to tugs to active debris removal to complex robotic servicing to you know, sometimes including space manufacturing in that as well. I, I, keep, I take a very broad interpretation of it. But there are a lot of companies and all of them think that they can boil the ocean and they'll do refueling just because they're doing other servicing. Um, we positioned ourselves as doing refueling like we're a gas station, not a, not a tow truck. Um, and most folks come around to realizing that <clears throat> the bigger immediate market that they want to tackle is the servicing market, and it's better if somebody else handles the refueling. So, um, yeah, there's a general trend from, from folks that want to do everything to folks that, that then pick and choose. Um, that said, there are a few that are still pushing on, on refueling, and uh, yeah, we, we wish them luck. Our goal is to provide a better service, a cheaper service, and stay ahead, not stay stagnant. If we ever stagnate, we deserve to be disrupted. Right. Uh, that's fair enough. Uh, so so I, I want to talk about the fundraising environment right now, and I won't ask the question, how is it? Because it's been tough, I know, Don't on everyone. It. <laughs> it's, been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been very difficult, to say the least, and we, we've, we've, we've talked about that at nauseum here on, on the show. But uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is, you know, as, as we do actually have quite a bit of investors who, who, who listen to this, um, what do you think are investors missing in, in, your, in your story? Like, what, what, do you, what, do you, what are the common questions that you get, like question number one, question number two, that you're just like, you know, I wish there was a slightly better understanding of this because that's just a fundamental piece of the equation that you feel like is missing when folks like look at the company. Well, you, you, you set me up to toot the horn of Orbit Fab perhaps a little bit because we closed the Series A in 2023. Yep. Um, so we're pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, those investors didn't miss much. The, um, what are investors doing? The only thing harder than raising money for a startup, I think, is raising money for a fund. Um, and then even you raise the money and the LPs tell you to not do capital calls because the market's bad. Right? Just raising the fund still isn't enough. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty harsh. And I've seen a lot of friends in, in VC land go through some from tough times and everything has to be delayed. So that's just the nature of, of the market. Um, <clears throat> but the investors are always having to choose, like, what is the story they believe in? What futures do they believe in? How do they hedge their risks? How do they build a portfolio? I mean, how do they get returns? What's their, their risk-adjusted returns and everything? And, yeah, when you can get 5% by just putting your money in the bank, right, that's, that's an interesting place for it. Everybody else has then got to do better than that. Um, these business cycles are, you know, they're, they're useful in that they'll clear out some, uh, some things that were perhaps over-invested. But the boom cycles are also useful because you, you fund some things that wouldn't otherwise get funded, some wild things, and some of those pay off massively. So the business cycles are helpful to the economy. They're not necessarily painless, that's for sure. But we're just in that period of the cycle where um, good, solid businesses that are well run, and they have to be both, right? Um then they're going to survive and they're going to thrive and they're going to be in a, in a position to use more capital as it becomes available. Uh, and those get, that can prove they've got growing balance sheets and, and everything else are going to be able to get more capital in. But yeah, it's just, it's tough right now. And some businesses that, that might be good businesses won't quite make it. But more of the businesses that aren't good businesses for one reason or other um, won't won't make it and, and we'll end up with a, a cleaning out. That's that's just how it goes. The, the beauty of the American system is that creative destruction. Right? Try things and then don't hang on them to them too long if they if they're gonna fail, let them fail. I'm on startup number four. I've I've been around this, I've seen a few cycles. Um, right now the the story of the day is survive, make the progress, lock in the customers, think deeply about that, keep your good people get through to the next cycle where capital gets a little cheaper. On that note, are there any commercial or regulatory milestones that uh, prospective investors or just followers of the company should be watching out for? Yeah, with Orbit Fab, I mean, the, the big thing we have is selling the fueling ports, right? The, each fueling port that goes from a satellite to orbit is serviceable market for us. And growing that serviceable market is the most important thing we can do. So this year, the biggest thing that we're looking at is, is that selling fueling ports. Uh, and shipping fuel imports. Then next year, of course, 2025, it's that delivery to the government. End to end, prove it for a customer, get paid by that customer for making a delivery. At that point, it's game on, right? All the risk is taken off the table. 
um, that's a, our biggest value inflection right there. Because at that point, I mean, we get told by all the big satellite operators, prove it works in orbit and we will come and beat your door down. Uh, and that's it. Right? That's what we've got to do. So as someone who has spent some time in mining and thought about asteroid mining and, and, and obviously worked on a business um, associated with that, uh, there's a number of companies that I can think of right now that are currently or recently have uh, started to to tackle this problem. Um, most of the businesses that have been around over the last ten or that have that have that have uh, launched over the last 10, 15 years, uh, ultimately, I think the biggest problem um, and correct me if I'm wrong has o- always been timing and the lack of capital uh, of uh, like uh, availability in, in capital markets. Do you, uh, and feel free to refute that if you disagree. But I'm curious to ask what is what do you think about the current um, uh, the current companies that are working on asteroid mining? Is is the time now right? How how, how long do we have in that podcast? <laughs> You've asked a question that I've been asking myself for twenty five years now. Um, I believe that there are five risk areas, or you could, you could call them opportunity areas if you look at at mining generally. Um, a change in any one of these areas will result in a new paradigm in mining. But to stand up a new paradigm, all five of them have to work, at least to, you know, to, a, to a level where a business case closes. The first one is, is geological risk. Do you know what's in the ground? Right? And if you don't, how do you dig it? And because we've got the grab samples of meteorites, we know what the minerals are on the asteroids. We can match the spectra, the reflection spectra, but we don't know about the diggability. We don't know whether it's fluffy or just like cement or covered in a layer of asphalt. So we learn every mission on asteroid teaches us more, but so far, N equals three, right? Osiris Rex and two Japanese missions. That's not a lot of, of missions to say statistically the next one's going to look like the last three. We need a few more missions, right? And that's and we haven't looked at, at bulk compositions, what the what the, the diggability does with depth. Long story, geology, one risk. Second risk, of course, technology. Do you have something that can then extract that material and you know separate out the constituent parts uh, that you need and everything like that, right? And and that's transportation, that's extraction, that's refining, that's the whole chain on the technology side. The third one, and <clears throat> one that's most important, and the one that Orbit Fab, frankly, is is working on for the asteroid mining companies, is the market, right? Who's buying your commodity when uh, radium was? Six hundred thousand dollars an ounce. There were radium mines getting set up all over the world, um, and then all of a sudden, we we're able to make cobalt sixty out of uh, in nuclear reactors, and nobody needed it anymore, and that whole industry shut down. So, is there a market for your material? Are people buying it and selling it? That sets the price, and how volatile is it? And will you flood the market? All those kinds of questions. So, there's market risk. Um, then you've got the regulatory risk. If you want to get financing for mineral exploration, 60% of it or more goes through the Toronto Stock Exchange. You simply show up with your, your mining lease and you say, here's my theory on why there's, ro- there's valuable rocks on the ground. Give me some money to advance the, the maturity of this claim. And if you prove that something's there, you go and you sell it to the next guy who raises more money to take it to the next stage and on and on and on. But you've got to have that transferable asset. You have to have secure tenure over the minerals in the ground before you extract them. And notably, U.S. law, same with UAE and Luxembourg, um, which I think are the only three countries that have, have, have passed them so far, they're all like fishing in the ocean. You don't own the fish until they're on your deck. Like you can put a net around them. They're still not your fish, right? For mineral exploration, that just doesn't work. You can't finance that because if you spend $100 million to verify there's rocks there and somebody else jumps your claim, right? Someone else uh, it, it, imagine investors presented with somebody who says, I've invested $100 million and I know there's rocks there. I'm, I'm carrying debt on $100 million and I'm going to re- repay that, but give me more money, I'll build a mine. And someone else says, well, I know there's rocks there because he proved it and I don't have to carry the debt. Who are you going to invest in? Right? It's a no-brainer, So, which means the only people invest in it are those that don't care about the risk and can finance it all the way through. And that limits it to governments and billionaires. So right now, everybody who is not a government or a billionaire is completely excluded from financing because the regulatory environment won't give you secure tenure over minerals in the ground. 
We also don't know whether the tax rate's going to change, whether it's going to get appropriated. Like, where's, where's the court of competent jurisdiction? So many issues that come under country risk, right? And then, of course, there's financing risk. Can you aggregate enough capital to stand this up? So there's five risk areas, a long description. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, so I was going to ask you, if you weren't building Orbit Fab, what would you be building? But it sounds like it's not a mining company. <laughs> not yet, at least. Well, if you think about deep space industry, the big, hairy, audacious goal was asteroid mining. Mm-hmm. What we yeah. built was thrusters right. that could one day be fueled by material you could extract from an asteroid. Right? So I'm chipping away at this problem from various different angles. The company before that was Antarctic Broadband. And you know, we were a few years early trying to do effectively what OneWeb uh, and now Starlink and everything did, right? Paint the sky black with communication satellites. We built the first KA band transponder for CubeSats or NanoSats. In the back of my head, I'm like, well, what I need is a KA band transponder at 35 gigahertz, not 32 gigahertz, because that's the deep space frequency bands. And if I want to go explore an asteroid with a CubeSat so that I can get the capital cost down, I need a really small transponder. Right? Everything I've done has been inspired by and, and sort of around that theme. So I'd just be working on something else I expect that is related to asteroid mining will help move that ball forward. And I've been working on this for 25 years. We're 25 years closer. Well, um, I'm, I'm excited to see where we get to in the next 25 years. Uh, last question, Daniel. Uh, w- w- if, um, or I, I'll ask something different, actually. Um, any companies that you're particularly excited about right now in the startup ecosystem in space? Gosh, so many of them. Um, I'm going to talk to the in-orbit manufacturing companies. Um, you know, Vada, Space Forge, there's a, there's a, a few of them. Um, they're trying to figure out what you can do when you have microgravity, like what you can make. And I, I, the analogy, we like analogies. The analogy I have is to, to the vacuum pump, right? 150 years ago, the first vacuum pump was, in, it was invented that gave us industrial access to vacuum, to variable pressure. And now you have a jar with no air in it, which is pretty dumb. What do you do with a jar with no air? And the answer is, well, an enormous amount of stuff, right? We, we got um, vacuum packing and refrigeration and freeze drying and eventually vacuum tubes, which gave like, just so many things came out of that. All industrial processes changed. It's unthinkable to build a factory without vacuum these days. Now we're starting to get to the point where we have industrial access to space, to zero gravity. You can take gravity out of the jar. What do you do when there's no gravity in the jar? We have no idea because we don't have experience with it. But over the next 50 years, it's going to fundamentally change all manufacturing because you're going to need a step in the process where you remove gravity to get that crystal structure or to, con- to, to keep the materials away from touching the walls or to remove buoyancy so that you don't get internal stresses. Various things are going to happen. And if you need a piece in the manufacturing at one end and a piece at the other end, you do the whole manufacturing in space, you end up just doing everything in space. We're going to end up saving the planet because we move 10 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year off Earth by moving manufacturing off Earth. That is exciting. We're going to start living and working at these factories. Like So many things are going to happen, so many new materials, uh, so many, yeah, it's such a fundamental change. Those are the ones that most excite me. Of course, OrbitFab, we just want to be the industrial chemical suppliers to all of that manufacturing. I was going to say, an exciting future that we'll need a lot of refueling. (laughs) 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 Well, Daniel, thanks so much for being on the show. This is great. Uh, Pleasure. We have at least two different reasons for you to come back on. We got to talk now. We got to talk a lot of analogies and we got to talk mining because clearly you have a lot of thoughts and ideas and opinions so thanks uh, really, I'm going to go read this book that sounds good cool. really appreciate you joining and uh, looking forward to having you back uh, sometimes take care